we ask uh, towards the end uh, that there uh, we have a little survey. We always appreciate feedback, how we can do this better next time. So I'm going to put in the chat um, a link to that. It's like a, a survey monkey type of a survey. So at your convenience, uh, if you could really fill that out, we would appreciate it quite a bit. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. So Ali, I think you should be all set to uh, share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Let me try and share my screen here. And then normally we would sort of do a round table and do introductions so I could get a sense of what boards you're on and where you're from, but maybe we can use the chat function and you can, I can monitor that if you want to put in sort of what role you're playing. So let me get the presentation up. Um, let's see, I guess for, for everyone's sake, I think we've got a pretty good mix of zoning board, DRB type folks, zoning administrators, and a few planning commission members. So I don't know if you want to go more in detail, Allie, or is that, is that good enough? Nope, I think that's fine. So... Let's see, can everyone see the screen before I get started, the presentation view? Good, okay. So um, just quickly, I'm Allison Hopkins. I'm a planner at Montescutney Regional Commission with Jason and sort of as Jason already alluded to, the piece that I'll be going over um, and hoping to fully cover and get your questions answered on is the difference between meetings and hearings, um, some tips on how to conduct them and um, due process as well and how to ensure that due process is being met. Um, they're sort of at the bottom, you see that funny, what does that word mean? No, mo, me, see. Um, I don't use this, but it might be a way for um, you to think of um, due process and how to ensure that that is being met. So no, mo, me, what does that mean? So notice, opportunity to be heard, maintaining order, management of evidence, and management of conflicts of interest. So just to unpack those a bit further, what does proper public notice mean? Um, we'll go into this a bit further in the slides um, further down, but it's basically public notice, giving the public notice by posting of an agenda of a meeting that is coming up. Opportunity to be heard. Um, boards have a structure to follow to allow the public to be heard. You can have a limit on that. Um, that really depends on your procedures. An orderly proceeding. So that sort of goes on. We'll talk about what a good chair can do, but that's sort of one of the pieces that a good chair can help um, ensure the flow of the meeting, how it's conducted, uh, when people can speak, and um, your rules of procedures can help in that regard. So every town will have a set of rules of procedures. If you haven't seen them in a while, it might be good to dust them off and, and take a peek and, and look at those. And then managing conflicts of interest, making sure that um, the proceedings are fair, that there is disclosure of any types of conflicts of interest and in any ex parte communications. All of those will also go into a little bit further down the slides. Um, if there's any questions while we're going through them, um, just wave and maybe Jason can look or put a hand up or put it in the chat and we'll address it either at the end or, or during the presentation itself. So types of hearings, we get a lot of questions sort of, there, there's many different types, lots of boards use them. What are the differences? Um, so this, this slide sort of tries to unpack that, but basically a meeting is um, any time a majority of board members are convening to discuss business or take action. They're generally legislative, but they don't have to be. Um, who does it? As you see, all public bodies hold meetings. 
Then there are legislative and quasi-judicial hearings. A quasi-judicial hearing is basically a fancy term word for sort of just a hearing. It occurs when the rights of a party are being considered. Basically, the two differences between those categories of legislative hearings and quasi-judicial hearings are that legislative decisions establish policies for future applications, while the quasi-judicial hearings and decisions are the applications of those policies. So for example, a legislative decision, again, one that establishes policies could include the adoption of ordinances, amendments to ordinances, passing budgets, um, and that. And then examples of quasi-judicial hearings would be those that apply those previously approved decisions by the legislative body. And those could, those include variances, site plan hearings, and the like. So legislative hearings are usually conducted by the planning commission and the select board. And then those quasi-judicial hearings are um, the zoning board development uh, review board. Are there any questions around that? There was a lot of sort of I feel like the quasi-judicial, just the way that they're phrased and termed um, often gives people some, some head scratching. What does it actually mean? And then board meetings, those board meetings are typically run um, as outlined in Robert's Rules of Order. So basically in a basic sense, it just means um, you contribute to discussion on agenda items, you make a motion for actions. Those motions are seconded by other members and then there's a vote on the motion. If there's no questions, we'll come back to this a little bit later, but um, a big topic right now, and this is the next slide, we'll talk about where we are now um, in the middle of the pandemic, COVID-19 and what those changes have been. But generally, all of these meetings and hearings are protected by Vermont's open meeting law. And basically what this means, it's just sort of how we provide transparency and how the public has a right to attend, voice their opinion, and are made aware of meetings that are happening um, and how we protect that due process. There are some exemptions to the open meeting law. Um, those include, there are certain electronic communications that are allowed as long as it doesn't involve business. So you can use email to coordinate a meeting, to send out agendas, to distribute materials, but we'll go in further that it's not to conduct or discuss business, but those other, those other examples are okay to do electronically. Um, another exemption is executive session. This one is often used by select boards to discuss um, personnel, that sort of thing. It's for making confidential decisions about certain topics, um, personnel, as we talked about, litigation, court cases, and um, specific contracts. And then the other uh, main exemption is deliberative session. So that's used by the quasi-judicial boards to deliberate on the evidence that was presented at the hearing in the during the public meeting. So what does open, what is open meeting law? What is it, why do we use it? Um, what's it for? It's basically emphasizes, you know, openness and accessibility to government. It's public bodies should be open to the public at all times. And it's, it's meant to create transparency and to um, require advanced public notice. <coughs> um, let's see, the law mainly applies when there is a quorum of a public body, when they are involved in taking action or, or a discussion on that action. And the subject matter of the discussion is one over which the body has the authority or responsibility. So open meeting law, it requires that you post advance notice, you make the agenda available before the meeting, and then we'll go in further how long before the meeting in a bit. And in, mostly it's posted at the municipal office to other places that you have design, designated prior and on, on your website if your town has a website. 
we've already talked about it's there to let the public participate and be made aware of any upcoming meetings. And then a big one uh, that we're still sort of getting the word out there, even though it's been there for a while, is to make the minutes of the meeting available within five days after the meeting has been held. And then a big one we also want to know, the big transparency piece is if there are complaints, you should address those complaints. So if someone has um, said you did not follow X step of the open meeting law, it's best that you get in front of that and you address that complaint head on. Um, there is a link down here. You don't have to, don't worry about writing this down. We have a resource link at the, at the end of this presentation and we can send those out as well. But there is, there's a really good frequently asked questions on the VLCT, VLCT site all about open meeting law. Okay, so what has changed? What are we doing right now? What has changed? Um, how are we holding meetings and how can we hold meetings? So um, Governor Scott uh, in March of 2020 signed Act 92 into law, it's House Bill 681. Um, it sets forth temporary new open meeting law procedures in response to COVID-19. And these will be effective throughout the duration of the governor's declared state of emergency. Um, I reached out to VLCT to see if some of these might be permanent changes. Uh, and they haven't, there's nothing sort of in the legislation right now to make these permanent, but there is some talks about, you know, what have we learned from, from this past year? So I think stay tuned there, we might see something. So what has, what has temporarily changed? Um, bodies, public bodies can meet by electronic or other means without being physically present in a location. That means you can hold a remote meeting as long as you use technology that allows the public to attend by electronic or other means. You can allow the public to access the meetings by telephone as well as um, Zoom is a frequent one pe people have been using or whatever other web-based meeting you've been using. Uh, you also, it waives the requirement of a physical meeting space. You don't have to designate that. And then there's another sort of caveat. You'll see the asterisks at the end. You can extend the time limit for posting meeting minutes from that five day requirement to 10 calendar days. It, that's really meant if you're having a staffing shortage that is related to the pandemic and you need that extra time. It's not meant to just Ah, we can't get around to it. We're going to go for 10 days, but it is there. It is there if you are having facing some challenges um, due to the pandemic. So they've extended that time. And then there's also some changes to the physical posting requirements as well. Um, and we'll go into that, what those changes are in just a bit. Okay. Now sort of Back to public notice for those for those different types of meetings. And these are also, you'll see a lot of 15 days versus seven days, which is which. And um, we've highlighted some pieces in here where you can find out what those posting requirements are a bit easier, but um, it's it does change depending on what type of meeting you are posting. So for regular meetings, there are advanced notice for all of these, whenever, like we've talked about before, whenever your meeting is you know, a quorum of a public body, you have to give advance notice to the public. So for regular meetings, that means you are posting a notice uh, at least 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Um, that is usually done on the website, uh, near your municipal office at town, and then two other places that you've pre-designated. Special meetings are a 24 hour notice. And then emergency meetings are, you, you have to provide some notice as soon as possible before the meeting. So it might be five minutes before that emergency meeting. If, that, if that's all that's possible, then that's fine. And just posting a notice is, is works. You don't have to do all the public places as stipulated um, under the meeting column. So legislative hearings for plans and bylaws, um, that's a 15 day notice requirement. 
Um, and then to go into the number of hearings that you have. So it's always at least one planning commission meeting. But if you're a municipality over 2,500, then you're required to have two hearings. So you would be doing this posting requirements twice. Mm -hmm. So that's that 15 day notice. It has all of the, the website, the town and the two other places like we've gone over previously. And then it also, if you've designated a newspaper of record, you also have to post it there. And for quasi judicial hearings, that's where we get tripped up. What's the difference between that, that seven and 15 day notice? So for um, conditional use review, variances, administrative appeals, final plat reviews for subdivisions, all other types of development review. So that public warning notice is 15 days. So then other types of development review, including site plan review, that is a seven day notice. And I didn't put, I think I linked it somewhere else, but I, the two specific statutes for those, um, I can, let's see, one, it's 24 VSA 4464 is where you would find this specific posting requirement. So if you want to read more about that seven versus 15 days and what that means, that's where you would find it. And we can, we can, we'll send this out as well. So you'll have it. Any questions yet? Okay. This slide just shows um, sort of the typical flow of a quasi-judicial hearing. Um, rules are typically stricter for a quasi-judicial hearing because the board's deciding how to apply the law and protecting due process that we've talked about before. So like we can go through each of the steps and if there's questions, um, we can sort of unpack those. But basically um, the chair opens the hearing and we'll talk about um, what the flow of the meeting and what the expectation of the meeting that night will be. And let's see, the applicant will then go and present upon their proposal and requests. Board members will ask questions um, and keep the zoning bylaws in their mind and specific provisions in the land use regulations as they're as they're asking their questions and hearing from the applicant. Comment from interested parties and the public will be at that time. And then the chair will close the public hearing in open deliberations. But before they open deliberations, it's important to note that hearings can be continued by the board until they're ready to make a decision. So if, if a board feels like they haven't gotten enough evidence or presentation facts, from the applicant, they can ask those questions and they can continue the hearing to another date, place and time to get that additional evidence. So a board should never feel like they have, they, that the meeting's over, okay, we need to close it and we need to make a decision. It is the board's right to take their time and to get everything that they feel like they need to make to make a decision. And then I think it's also important to note that decisions don't need to be made that night. A board doesn't need to sit around and, and sort of and unpack this all after, you know, perhaps a, a long two hour meeting um, and that a vote doesn't equal this a decision either. So as you'll see in number six, those decisions are a written decision. And that's, that's technically when that decision has been made when there's a concurrence of the majority on that written decision. Let's see what else we have here. So what's what's a good board chair? I'm sure we've all sat on boards where we, you know, we've we've seen different personalities and um, what makes a good chair? So a good chair. Um, is vital so that you have a smooth, efficient and productive meeting. Um, you want a board that is able to keep board members and the public on track, um, never ending debates. We've all been there. Um, so you want a board that, that has the right, gives people um, 
the ability to make their comments, but also sort of knows when to, to shut it down and move things along when it just keeps going. Um, another important um, trait of a chair is the ability to turn discussion into an action. So how did they do that? They could state and restate the question and ask for discussion and help move that discussion along. They can recap discussion points, um, that's helpful. And then they can also help coax emotion if, if nobody's, if, every, if board members are feeling shy, um, they can sort of summarize that discussion and point to specific actions and then maybe um, point to emotion based on those specific actions. Um, and that sort of, that bottom point, bringing the board to a resolution after a discussion. Uh, a good chair is not necessarily the person that has served the longest on the board. Um, it's just someone who doesn't always have to contribute their own opinions and take over the entire meeting, but sort of also has the ability to sit back and listen to others' opinions as well. They don't have to be the most outspoken on the board. So that's, that's just a myth. Just because you've been on the longest doesn't make you the chair. Okay, your roles and other board members' roles at a quasi-judicial hearing. Um, it is your, let's see, you're also sort of there to listen um, to others' opinions, formulate your own, uh, not hog the meeting. Uh, so you're there to listen to that testimony and evidence, ask questions so you can um, get all the facts that you need to render a decision. No regulations, refer back to those as needed. Um, make sure you're avoiding conflicts of interest and disclosing those when you, I mean, it happens. It's a, we all live in a small area. We all run into each other at gatherings or at the supermarket. Just get in front of those and disclose those at any, at any meetings. And base your decisions on the evidence that's been presented. So no um, predisposed opinions and use those regulations to make that decision. And then let's see, must not prejudge a matter or publicly express opinions on a pending case. So we'll get into sort of those, uh, like we just talked about running into a quorum at the supermarket or, or emailing those decisions out. I did have a question yeah. in the chat. What happens I... once a hearing Sorry, we did have a question in the, the chat. chat. Do you want to deal with that uh, at the end or do you want to do that now? Um, so do you want to tell, I can't see the chat in presentation mode. So, so Shannon, Shannon asks um, if a DRB closes a hearing and decides to deliberate in private, uh, please confirm that it just needs to be stated that the board will deliberate, deliberate in private. Yeah, so right in this slide, we can we can get into that. And then if I haven't answered the question fully, um, repost it in the chat or just come off mute and ask. So um, once the hearings are closed, the rest of the work is done um, in deliberative sessions. So that work means making a decision. Um, again, we've gone over that this deliberative session is exempt from open meeting law. And there's no requirement for public notice or minutes during deliberative session. So I think this is to you. So me, so deliberative sessions can be public <laughs> or private. Most um, I have always seen are generally done in private. Um, it's a good question. I actually don't know if it's a requirement, Jason. Do you know, to, I mean, you do have to state you're going into deliberative session to make a decision. And I do believe um, that you have to, yes, I do believe that you have to note whether the, that deliberative session is being open to the public or not, because that's usually when you excuse the public from that area. And do, and do you have to like make a motion and have it, uh, you know, have everybody vote on it that you're going to, I mean, I usually just ask, so we can do, do you want, want to talk about this in, in public or private and we'll make a decision. But honestly, I don't know if we always uh, ask for a motion and then you know, everybody vote for for that final decision, you know, to make the decision to deliberate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know how specific that component has to be for the to, to move forward. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that it's a legal requirement. I think it's good practice that might be in your um, rules of procedures. You definitely have to, you know, make a motion to close that hearing and to move into deliberative session. Um, and then I think it's just good practice to state whether that's a public mm -hmm. or private deliberative session. Um, I can start, we'll look up and certainly get back to you whether that's a legal requirement okay. to state that, but I think it is good practice to do so. Thank you. Because often there's like a two or three things on the hearing, so you don't deliberate right then and there. So it's really right. just moving to the next item. So, all right. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so then in that deliberative session, you don't have to reveal how each board member has voted. Um, it, like we said, it just has to, that vote just has to show a concurrence of the majority when you make that written decision. And then you have 45 days to issue a decision. If you don't issue that written decision within those 45 days, it would be deemed approved. And like we've talked about before, and as you've noticed, there's usually always business afterwards. So you do not have to make the decision that same night. You, you have, and it is recommended that you take the time given to you for a thoughtful deliberation before issuing a decision. Okay, conflicts of interest. So we've all time, we all run into each other at the supermarket, right? We, everybody knows everybody and everybody's always talking. What do we do about that? And what are conflicts of interest? Um, they can be financial, whether it's a direct or indirect financial impact, uh, personal, also the same, direct or indirect, um, a, you know, a predisposed bias or prejudice would be a conflict. And then we'll go into what ex parte communications are. Um, so those are the, the different types. Um, ex parte communication is just a direct or indirect communication between sort of a member of that public body, the DRB, and anyone else outside a public hearing on matters that involve the application in question or the application to be presented. Um, so DRB members shouldn't be discussing the pending case again with someone at the farmer's market or supermarket or, or gas station, wherever you are, um, but it happens. Uh, so if you happen to do it inadvertently, it's just best to get in front of it and disclose it, uh, the interaction at the public hearing and decide if you can go on with making a vote on that application. Sort of that quote down there um, is very true. It takes years to build trust with the public, but just one misstep to destroy it. So uh, it's just that getting in front of it, things happen, we all talk, we all live in Vermont, small towns. Um, just disclose it if you think it's been done and, and go from there. Let's see, what can we do about managing conflicts of interest since we all, we all live in such tiny little bubbles? Um, rules of <laughs> let's just get let's give her technology a minute to catch up <clears throat> so what I think, <laughs> I think we lost Allie. Um, we, I was afraid of that, to be honest with you. Um, we've got quite a bit of snow here and we've been having power outages and I think she's, she's experiencing the same thing. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna try to find her presentation and um, yep, her power just went off. <laughs> so bear, bear with me here for just a second. Okay. I'm going to try and uh, impersonate Allison here for a second. So <laughs> bear with me here. Okay. Let's see where she left off.
Okay. Um, whoops. I believe she left off here. Um, again, conflicts of interest. I think she covered that pretty well. Um, adopt those rules of procedure and ethics. Um, I've, I know a number of towns have adopted them back, you know, 2005 and, and then forgot all about them. Um, so uh, you might want to dust those off. You know, it actually might be a good practice to uh, every year at your um, organizational meeting, maybe you revisit them and adopt them all over again, or at least read them. Um, that's always a good idea. Um, yep, uh, Ali was talking about the ex parte communication. Uh, you know, you want to avoid it, um, but generally speaking, stuff happens. If it does, just disclose it. Tell, tell folks at that, at that hearing, hey, you know, I saw so-and-so at the concert or whatever, <laughs> and, uh, and he told me of all about the project and, you know, that sort of thing. You can just, just disclose it. Um, and recuse yourself if necessary. No one's going to make you recuse yourself, but that's really up to you to, if you think it um, because of personal interest or perceived uh, personal interest, you know, you should step down just for the good of the order. Um, if in doubt, uh, I've, I've been on boards before and I've asked the group, hey, you know, this is the situation. Do you think I should recuse myself? And I took it upon myself to just see what the, the rest of the board members felt. And then I would, you know, decide from there. Um, and again, uh, use alternates. Uh, there so a planning commission that's serving a quasi-judicial function can have an alternate. If they're doing legislative business, they cannot. So that's a little weird, uh, a weirdism, but um, generally speaking, all other DRBs and ZBAs can all have alternates. It's really a good idea to have them. Um, and that really comes into play when, not only when somebody's out of town or whatever, but also when there is a conflict. So um, anyway, keep, Keep that in mind. So any, let's see. So for more information, um, these, these and other um, documents are available. If you go to this um, vpic.info um, website, uh, those as, and a number of other resources are available. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Um, are there any questions on the meetings, the hearings, and, and that sort of process at this point? J uh, Jason? Yes. Yeah, I, I have a quick one. Um, I don't know why you just called it, but um, it's, it's, it's like a yearly meeting that the board might have amongst themselves, I assume, to talk about things like procedures and whatever else that we want to talk about. Um, I'm not so sure we always do that. So is that somewhere written where we, where we should do that, you know, because I don't really think we voted on huh, the chair from year to year. Maybe we have, I'm just trying to get it all right if we haven't. So maybe we have, but is there anywhere I can look into that? Well, you know, it's, it's certainly a good practice. I, I would say every year, to do that, um, I believe generally a lot of, well, boards are supposed to have rules of procedure. Yeah, we, have those. That's, we have those. That's usually where that's spelled out. Um, mm. I don't know, at least the ones I've seen um, have said something about meeting, um, you know, like every year after town meeting, okay. the select board might appoint new members, et cetera. Um, it's, I think, a good idea, and it might be spelled out in your rules of procedure that you know, you should have an organizational meeting and where you, um, the board every year, new members come in, uh, you know, you, you, you reappoint the board chair or whatever it is. And that, if you do that, um, that's, I think, a good time to just take out those rules again, yep. um, look at them, update them, et cetera. Okay. And if it's not in there, we would talk about amending it. And do we do it or does the select board do it? Who, who, who does that? Who amends those? So each, each board is supposed to basically have their own rules of procedure. So that would be 
you know, the, the DRBs, um, in your case, the DRB would have their own. Okay, thank you, Jason. So, Jason, Bill, yes. Uh, will Allison's <clears throat> uh, slides be available to us? Yeah, we can, we can make them available and- um, It would be helpful actually, to me, review with our boards um, using those. Yeah, so we can, we can email them to you or we can post them on our website or maybe both. So um, now just for my benefit, I think I know pretty much <laughs> all of you except two. Um, Dick, wh what town are you from? West Windsor, I, I've dealt with you oh. before. And I, was, I know you. Yeah, I just didn't recognize you. Okay, good to see you. I, I don't have my. I don't know how I get my. Don't get my last name up there, and I have had this problem before. So, I'll have to look into how they can put Beatty at the end of Dick. In any event, I think I think this is very interesting. Good. And um, Bob Greenfield, I don't believe I know you. Uh, what town are you from? I'm on the uh, development review board in Chester. So now I've figured out who you all are. Yeah, we'll, we'll follow up and we'll send these um, presentations uh, to you. And, um, and you can certainly ask us follow-up questions too. Um, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about sort of the types of review. Um, so let's see, bear with me here for a second and I will pull that up. Okay. Uh, Okay, can everybody see that? Yep, yes. Okay, and again, um, I'm, I'm more interested in answering specific questions than I am talking at you. So definitely feel free to kind of put your hand up or, um, you know, chat, put a, chat, a question in the chat box or something like that. Um, so more recently, we've fielded a lot of questions about sort of the types of review and my sense was that may might not be clarity on sort of which ones are you know appropriate in which certain situation and of course there's no perfect answer to that but um we thought it would make sense to, to just at least give you a quickie uh overview and talk a little bit about when you might want to think about doing what steps etc um but again definitely more interested in, in, in talking about if you have questions or if question or if issues have come up. Um, so in real basic overview, um, Vermont's what we call a Dillon's rule state. Um, it's not a home rule state. What that really basically means, so like Massachusetts, for example, is a home rule state. Uh, a town in Massachusetts has a lot more autonomy to create rules and regulations. In Vermont, you know, we're pretty much uh, you need to be empowered under state law to do stuff, right? To, to have regulations. And so when it comes to planning and zoning, we, we go, we look at chapter 117. That's sort of the Bible, if you will, that tells us what towns are enabled to do. Um, there are different ways to look at it. <laughs> you know, how specifically is it enabled or not? Um, so there's, a, there's some nuance there, but generally speaking, you, you want to look at what's um, what's enabled in chapter 117. And you really need to follow the, any specific um, guidance that, that that provides. So as such, um, land use bylaws, I'm calling up. Some towns call a zoning ordinance or subdivision regulations or, or whatever. That's okay, but generally speaking in chapter 117, they're all called bylaws. Um, so you'll hear me say bylaws, but it's sort of, it relates to all the, all the above. Um, they are a bylaws, zoning, um, subdivision, flood regs. Those are all regulatory tools that are intended to implement your town plan under this um, chapter. And to do so, they're supposed to be in conformance with the municipal plan. And there's a little bit of wiggle room as to what that means. Um, and they also are supposed to be adopted for the purposes of um, the section 4302, that, that's generally where um, the state planning goals are located and there's some overarching principles that um, are purposes for planning in Vermont that are 
spelled out there. So again, there's been some questions <laughs> recently about, well, what does that mean? And, you know, I don't think there's a perfect answer to that. Um, I don't think section, my personal opinion, uh, and I'm no attorney, I don't think section 4302 is quote unquote mandatory. Um, you know, it, it, it provides some really clear guidance to communities, but generally speaking, you know, it's, it's a sequence where the town has a town plan and that's where a community spells out how that community wants to meet those goals. And then they adopt the zoning and the zoning then needs to be in conformance with the plan. So I, I guess I would, I'm gonna leave it at that, but there could be follow-up questions, which would be fine. Um, and let's see, um, there's a lot of different tools in chapter 117. We're gonna look at some of them, but certainly not all of them. And all of them have a lot of nuance as to how you go about implementing them. So. This screen here is intended, may not have all of the, uh, there might be actually an extra review process or two, but um, hopefully it's most of them. Um, I'm gonna go through most of these in some detail. I'm keeping an eye on the clock though. I don't wanna go too long. And again, I wanna be more about questions. Um, but generally speaking, permitted uses are you know by right. So again, if you're in a residential zoning district, it's like a house, those sorts of things. Those are simple, easy um, projects. Generally, you get a zoning permit and it's a fairly straightforward process. Site plan uh, is, again, another option, um, but it, it is one that's generally focused on the sort of the internal site layout and design. Um, conditional use, on the other hand, often is more about external impacts. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, planned unit developments, frankly, don't happen a whole, a whole lot. Um, maybe Ludlow has some, you know, we all have them, but there ha we haven't had many of them, generally speaking, in the last 10 or so years. So I'll probably skip over that a little bit more than some of the other sections. Waivers are, I think, a great tool. Uh, not always, they're, they're not always used, but I think that's a nice, a nice option for providing some flexibility. Variances are still there, but they are difficult. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but waivers might be a, a, nice, a, a nice tool if you don't have them. Um, flood hazard and river corridor and also actually um, shoreland um, bylaws are also another thing. I probably won't touch on that too much here today, but Many of you have them many, well, I think you all have them. Um, so we certainly could talk if there's questions about it. Design review, we can also talk about a little bit, um, but that's generally more about sort of the design of the exterior of buildings in certain Im important historic or downtown districts. Administrative review is something that's used, but probably not tapped to its fullest extent. We'll talk a little bit more about what that might look like and subdivision, um, generally the creation of new lots and infrastructure to serve them. And then um, in subdivision, waivers are wide open. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, anyway, this is just sort of a snapshot of, of what we're about to talk about. Um, so with permitted uses, um, you know, again, these are, you know, uses that are established by right. That generally speaking, you know, these should be the easy the easy stuff that you um, that you definitely want to have happen or you have to require through this sort of a process. So things like a single detached house, generally speaking, need to go through this uh, permitted use process in, in a zoning, um, excuse me, in a, in a residential district, generally speaking. Um, there might be some nuance to that sometimes in a downtown district Sometimes in a conservation district, you'll see a, a single family house as like a conditional use review. I don't know if I love that, but it's not necessarily wrong. Like that's, that's legally okay, I believe. Um, something else you might wanna think about with this is, um, and, and I don't see it a lot, is in say a village area or um, 
you know, high density residential, you know, you might, you might expand those lists. Usually this is a pretty short list in, in most zoning bylaws. You might want to think about expanding that list just to make it easier for, you know, some little office to, you know, go into some vacant storefront or, or what have you, you know, the, it, it might be a, a good tool for housing developments, uh, affordable housing developments, or some, you know, just smaller retail type operations that, you know, you know, are kind of a no brainer. So again, it's, it's something to think about. Um, it's a short, easy process, no hearing, all that kind of stuff. Um, so for site plan review, um, I believe, I, maybe I'm wrong, I believe there's some maybe differences of opinion. There's sort of the site plan I call the lowercase site plan, which you get, you, you tend to get a site plan or a sketch with any application. And I, I've heard some towns talk about site plan, but I think they're actually referring to just the sketch. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. So this is the capital, you know, um, in caps site plan review process. And it's an option. Generally, it's looking at that internal site layout. Um, maybe thing, maybe it's appropriate for things like a, a mid to a larger apartment or some of those sorts of things where you really want to evaluate, say, pedestrian access to the building from the street. Um, where are the dumpsters? Are you screening them? You know, those, those sorts of issues. Um, like Ali was referring to, this, this requires a seven-day notice period. Um, some <laughs> more, but seven day minimum. Um, and these are the standards in statute. Um, you know, adequacy of parking, pedestrian circulation, et cetera, um, and other matters you see. And so a lot of towns do have other standards. Um, for example, you know, maybe you have forest management or you know, anti-fragmentation, maybe in the rural part of town, you, you, you require that sort of thing. Um, some towns have specific standards for different zoning districts. Um, you know, maybe in the village, you're looking at sidewalks and building orientation, whereas in the rural part of town, it's that forest, no cut zone, you know, that maybe it's that kind of thing. Um, and that's all I've got there. Um, so conditional use review. Um, generally, these are larger, maybe a little more impactful type projects uh, as opposed to site plan review, but it depends. Um, you, you tend to be more focused on the impacts of the project to the neighborhood surrounding it. Um, this, this has a 15 day notice period. It's a little longer, but um, the big difference I think is probably the standards. And this is where you know, you're generally looking at that character of the area you know, whatever that means and capacity of, of existing facilities and, and so forth, traffic on the roads. Um, so again, this is generally more types of developments that are gonna have you know, traffic generation concerns or you know, the noise is gonna impact all the neighbors or you know, the, those sorts of things, right? Um, and, and there's been a lot of questions about site plan versus conditional use review. You know, it's not always an easy answer, but I think it, it's something you want to just think about in terms of um, which is the right fit. And, and I know some towns I've heard, just you know, say the DRB has mentioned to me in past, like, oh boy, you know, we go through, we have all these applications and, you know, I'd say most of them, you know, all the standards just don't seem relevant. And, you know, if that's the case, you might want to reconsider um, which, which, require, which review process you're requiring for what projects. And you might even, you, you might even wanna look at those standards and just make sure they, you know, you fine tune them a little bit. There's the basic required standards, but then there's a, usually a lot more optional stuff that's in there and maybe they don't all make sense. Uh, there's a question, do you find that site plan review is typically required in a commercial or public type use? more so than residential use. Yes. Um, I, I think a lot of times multifamily housing is also in there too, but um, under statute, you really, you cannot 
require a single family house or a duplex to go through site plan review. And so basically you're, you're generally talking about um, non-residential uses, op but often apartments are in there too. Um, and one of the, another thing that's common is that site um, in a lot of towns, conditional use review um, often requires site plan review or it requires site plan um, standards that would, all, that would apply to any conditional use review project. So that's an optional thing, but that is um, not uncommon. So planned unit development, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but it used to use, some towns used to call, they used to have two categories, planned um, residential development. Um, that's not really a, a term in statute anymore, but you can have a residential PUD, for example. Um, this process provides a whole lot of flexibility in, in a lot of different ways, and you have a lot of um, a lot of discretion as to how you want to do that. And so, I, you know, again, really just spell it out in your bylaws and in terms of how that would work. Um, there's has been some confusion in some towns about PUD versus subdivision. Um, usually. A PUD has to go through subdivision as well. And, and you do wanna have some kind of language about a coordinated review process. Um, you know, you're often going through a conditional use review as well as sub subdivision and, and maybe other things. And you wanna just make sure that you can expedite the process, particularly when there's a planning commission doing a part of it and the zoning board doing another part of it. You wanna make sure it's, um, as clear as can be how that will work for an applicant. You, you know, you want that applicant to have a, a fairly streamlined or at least clear path to a to yes, if you will. Um, so waivers for zoning. Um, I think it's a, it's a nice tool. You do need to be careful with it. However, you don't wanna um, create yourself problems, but uh, you need to, if you do it, um, it's specific to dimensional standards, so setbacks and those sorts of things um, generally only. You do need to, in the bylaws, spell out a, what's that review process going to look like, what are the criteria by which you're going to, you know, determine whether or not it's okay or not to issue the, the waiver. Some towns say things like, you know, we'll, we'll offer like an up to 25% reduction in setbacks, based on you know, a number of different criteria. It's nice to have some, you know, you don't want to be too wide open, right? So that, that might not be a bad idea if you don't do that. Variances uh, are, are really, really generally difficult to, to issue. Um, I've been in other places where their variances are given out like candy. <laughs> I would say probably the vast majority of applications for a variance should probably end up with a no. Um, so again, I think the, the waiver is, is a nice, easier, more flexible way to address some things that, that often come up otherwise as a variance. And I'll, I'll leave that at that unless there's questions. Um, flood hazard, um, you all have it. Um, generally speaking, it, you know, as a town that has a national flood insurance program, it allows you to, um, you know, allows residents to get flood insurance. Um, but it's really complicated in terms of the standards and, uh, you know, implications for, for projects. And, you know, this could be a topic for a whole separate training session. So I won't get into too much of the detail. Um, but it, you, you also have the option of river corridors or possibly shoreland um, bylaws too. But I'm going to leave it at that unless there's questions that you have. Um, design review, you know, this is really more about, um, well, in our, in our neck of the woods, it's only basically downtown design review in a couple of towns. Um, it could be something else. It could have a, a special historic district that needs some special design um, oversight. But generally speaking, this is um, looking at the exterior building uh, modifications, signage, things like that, that come up and 
um, really with the eye of, of maintaining uh, you know, the historic character of, of that downtown district in, in our in Windsor and Springfield. I don't believe anyone else has this stuff. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that because I think Bill and others are, are more than familiar with it. And for the rest of you, it doesn't really apply, but we can talk if there's questions about, about that. Um, I'm just checking the chat. Okay, so I'm going to pause here. There's a couple questions in the chat. So Al's asking if an applicant brings forward something that is um, not in either permitted or conditional use. Primitive camp, for example, uh, what process is used? So um, it's a good question. So, you know, what is it? Is, is it a house? You know, I guess so part of it is some bylaws are explicitly clear that if it's not on the list, then it's prohibited. So if, if your bylaws have that, maybe it's prohibited. Um, but you might want to consider is, is that use, in this case of primitive camp, is it similar, is it effectively the same thing as a house? And there, thereby, then maybe you treat it similarly. It might have some issues you want to think about, uh, for example, wastewater. <laughs> but, um, but again, I guess I would, I would put it like that. So look to your bylaws. If it says that, you know, if, if it's not listed, then it's prohibited. Um, some towns have a other, um, which has its pluses and minuses, but it, that allows, you know, some flexibility because no list of uses is ever perfect. Um, it allows some flexibility to look at other stuff and, and what is that most similar to. And I think, you know, again, back to your specific question, primitive camp, is it, is it similar enough to a list to, to something else that's on the list. And you could treat it like that potentially. Um, and there was Debs asking if a town has a village center designation, should there be a design review in the zoning regs? You know, not necessarily. Um, the two towns in our region that have downtown design review um, did it, I think, in large measure to get downtown designation um, there are some more stringent prerequisites for that downtown designation than there are for the village center designation. So again, for village center, it's not required. Um, I think it's, it's a helpful tool, uh, you know, to sort of try to maintain our art, architectural integrity, historic character, and those sorts of things, but it does add an extra step to the process. Uh, it does add some costs and some delays potentially. And so it does, you know, it, if your goal is village revitalization, you know, it does add an extra step. And, and I'm not saying that's bad, but it does add an extra step. So I think, you know, you should really think about what is the, you know, what's the purpose of design review? And is it something that is appropriate to, to protect the, the integrity of the village, for example. So I hope those answered the questions. If, if there's follow-up, uh, we can talk more about it. A um, Couple more slides and then we can just kind of open it up. Uh, administrative review is often used for boundary line adjustments um, or sometimes uh, minor amendments uh, of projects that had received approval previously, um, but you know, those types that aren't going to be a, a major change and the, and they would not um, impact past permit conditions, for example. Um, it could be used for a lot more than that. Uh, statute is um, very broad. Um, and I think you have all kinds of opportunity to, to implement it Otherwise, so basically what you're talking about is if you have certain things that would ordinarily go through the zoning board or the planning commission or the DRB, but again, maybe back to that question of, well, boy, you know, a lot of the, the, the standards just don't, you know, aren't that relevant or, you know, maybe it's a quote unquote, no brainer of a project, you know, maybe 
Maybe you wanna think about it, um, allowing administrative review for that. Um, they basically would go through the zoning administrator's office and we wanna have some really clear criteria and that sort of thing for them. Um, and it's probably also a good idea to allow them to kick it back to the, to the DRB or the zoning board if it's not clearly um, meeting the, those criteria. But um, again, it's a tool that's underutilized, I would say. And, you know, subdivision, I think, I think it's generally pretty straightforward, but I've had some questions lately, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, generally speaking, um, it is when you're creating new lots. Um, and oftentimes, you know, you're looking at driveways, you know, access roads, um, how's power getting in there, water, sewer, which is made a little more difficult, I guess, by the state jurisdiction on wastewater and things like that. But generally speaking, you know, it's the creation of new lots and generally you want to make sure the new lots are buildable and not gonna cause you grief down the road with a future zoning permit. Um, one of the things that's not been as crystal clear is um, specifically for towns that have subdivision review, um, if you have a, what I call the landlocked lot or some other lot that does not have access to it, um, you, should, you should go through a subdivision process to, you know, to basically create that, that right of way for those lots. And so in a lot of bylaws, it's not clear. It just says the DRB has got to review it, but what does that mean? You know? So again, I think it's really important um, in general to spell out what the process is a lot of times it's, it's not always spelled out. So this is just one example of where it's often not spelled out. Something you wanna, when you're, next time you're updating your bylaws, you might wanna just look at that. Um, and the other thing I'd say about subdivision is that, you know, there's a lot of, usually there's a lot of steps and we have not had a lot of subdivisions lately and generally they're smaller. Maybe that's gonna change in the near term with people moving up here. I don't know, but something to think about is maybe streamlining it. Uh, a lot of towns are thinking about simplifying it. I don't know if that's a mistake or not, but a lot of towns are at a bare minimum making sure sketch plan or preliminary subdivision are optional, but some towns are getting rid of them. And you know, one thing you could consider is you, let's say you just had a final subdivision process. It becomes that just that much more important to run that hearing, you know, the way Allie was talking about, you know, keep it open until you, you're sure you have all the information that you need. Do you need that traffic impact study? Do you need, you know, road um, layout designs and, and so forth and so on. And, you know, really just keep the hearing open until you make sure you have all of the evidence that you need to make, to make a decision. Um, waivers and subdivision. So I think a lot of people look at all of the standards in subdivision and say, oh my gosh, there's no roads, there's no this, there's no that, it's over the top, um, which is true. But if you ever get a big one, you know, that might come in handy. So one option is to just use that waiver provision for that, where basically the applicant just says, hey, look, this is a small project. I don't, none of this stuff, this list of potential stuff, it really makes sense to me. Um, and one of the most common things that comes up is like that needing a full perimeter survey for some little boundary line adjustment, or maybe it's a minor subdivision. Um, you know, they, does it really make sense to have a full survey of that hundred acre lot for creating some little three acre lot? Maybe not. And so I think the waivers is a good way to, to get at that. So that, that's it. Um, I was going to shift to questions now. Um, I, I, so I guess what I should do, we had asked in advance, hey, if there's any questions out there, send them, send them to us. Um, this is what we got. So I'm going to go through this real quick, but, um, oh, excuse me. I sh shouldn't have done that. Let me pull that back up. There we go. All right, 
Um, so I'll go through, through these real quick, but um, also I, I really would like to make sure we can talk about whatever questions you have. Um, so this, what's the difference between the PC, the planning commission role versus the DRB role, the, the development review board roles? And what are, what are the responsibilities of each? So many of you have DRBs, some of you are on a zoning board, so you don't have that. Um, in the towns that have DRBs, the planning commission is um, exclusively focused on legislative stuff. Um, writing the town plan, preparing zoning updates, um, and that sort of thing. So relating back to Allison's slides, the planning commission has basically the legislative hearings only. They, they don't get into any of that quasi judicial stuff. That's all the DRB. The DRB is doing all development reviews um, or the zoning administrator would, would do the zoning permits, but the DRB would do everything else. And um, so I hope that answers that. But if you have a zoning board, in most cases, the planning commission might be doing um, subdivision review or site plan review or something like that, the zoning <coughs> thing else. Um, and so in those cases, the planning commission is doing two things. They're doing the legislative work, the town plan, the zoning updates, and then they're also shifting gears and doing a subdivision review or something like that um, as needed. So I hope that answers that one. Um, the follow-up was regarding that, um, what is the ZA's role? And um, the ZA's role is an interesting question. It's not, you know, they have a very clear role spelled out in statute and that is, to, you know, basically um, deal with zoning permit applications and guide applicants through the process, generally speaking. And so, you know, th their role is to help applicants apply for their project and, and um, then talk to the DRB chair. Okay, we got an application, let's schedule that hearing. And, and, and they go through that step. The ZA's role in statute with the planning commission isn't as clear. Um, it, it happens to appear that most zoning administrators do function as staff for planning commission and they do help with town plan updates and zoning updates as their time allows, which often doesn't allow much. <laughs> um, they're stretched thin oftentimes, but um, I hope that answers that question. Um, as an advisor to the boards, oh, so are they, again, back to the ZA's role, are they an advisor to the board or can they make unilateral decisions? Um, you know, that they can make unilateral decisions on zoning permit applications or for anything that's uh, an administrative review type of a situation. Um, a lot of the other stuff, it relates back to what are your bylaws enable them to do. I would generally suggest, I, you know, and especially if it's spelled out in the bylaws, I think they're the ones who say, okay, this application is administratively complete. We can now schedule that hearing. Um, I think that's, that's generally their, their role. Um, it might depend on each town if there's more beyond that. You know, some places have had more of like a, like a letter, like a memo, maybe. And I don't know if this happens. I don't know if it's desired, but maybe the zoning administrator offers uh, observations or recommendations on applications. Um, that might be possible. We might ask the zoning administrators on the call today what, what their role is or what they think it is, but that would be my two cents. Uh, again, their the job though is to administer the bylaws and, um, literally. And so whatever the bylaws say, that, that's what they should be doing, generally speaking. Um, Kathy, I might need some refresher on this. I think this was your question. So about the number of uses allowed on a single parcel. Um, so this relates back to for instance, um, <clears throat> if there's a single family home on a large parcel and somebody wants to build another single family home on that parcel, are they allowed to do that? Um, or if they have, um, uh, for instance, a, 
uh, wood processing, firewood processing application, can they add a stone processing application on the same parcel? It's confusing. In some ways, it feels like they're saying one use per parcel, but then there are, there's room, can you put more? Well, you know, I, to some extent, you know, I'm going to give you a bad answer and say it depends on what your bylaws say. Like, so I'm thinking of Weathersfield. If I'm, Willis, you can correct me. I, if I'm remembering right, I think it says pretty clearly in there, you know, one principal use per lot. Uh, and okay, there you go. So, you know, you can have a house, but you can't have two. Um, you can have your principal use and you can have accessory uses. Um, if your bylaws don't explicitly say that, then it's a little more of a question. Uh, I think it's always been an interpreted thing that that's the case. And that may not be the best thing. I, I think it's probably best for the bylaws to be really clearly stating that. Um, and you know something you might want to think about too is maybe allowing multiple principal uses on a lot is actually not a bad idea. Um, not to pick on Weathersfield, but I live in Weathersfield, so I'm going to pick on myself. Um, you know they they allow some multi or mixed use buildings in villages, but they make it go through like a PUD process. If some some towns are thinking more about allowing multiple uses, multiple principal uses on a lot in certain districts, let's say the village, um, that might be a much easier process for a, somebody to get a permit for. So again, it, it kind of depends what your bylaws say, um, but I think it's, in, in a lot of cases, it's not a bad thing to, to ha allow for one principal use per lot, but there in some instances, it, it might make a lot of sense to allow more. So I guess I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Kathy, any follow-up? Did I not answer that totally? So the so I noticed that there was no nothing in the bylaws that I could see that said one way or the other. But if someone had a large lot and they wanted to put a second single family house on it, eyebrows went up. And I and you know, you could make an argument that that could be a very complicated situation. Um, if somebody doesn't want to buy the this big lot with two houses, they'd have to subdivide. And um, there could be problems with the proximity of septic systems or something. I'm not sure. Um, I think it's, I th <clears throat> frankly, I think it's good practice to not allow that. I think, you know, I mean, you're already allowing a, a primary, you know, a house on a lot is the primary use and then they can have an accessory dwelling. It has to be a certain size and that kind of thing. So you're allowing flexibility that way. Any, you know, shared driveways and, you know, all of these things sound nice, but there's some headaches associated with them. You know, um, a lot of times they don't spell out shared maintenance very well. And, you know, you, you probably need, you probably would want to have some form of a not necessarily homeowners association, but something like it, where those two houses say, oh, okay, we, we both own this common lot or something. And, you know, this is how we're gonna pay for shared maintenance responsibilities, et cetera. So I think in a lot of cases, it makes much better sense to not allow for that. Um, but I think it, I would suggest your bylaws might wanna get updated so that, um, so that it just states it says that out instead of just assuming that, because it, it, some people who want it would say, what well, doesn't say I can't in the bylaws. So it kind of stuck in there. Right, you know, certainly I'm not an attorney, talk to an attorney, maybe their opinion will help you on that matter. But I think it, um, in terms of next steps, it would be good to just clarify that. In, okay. In yep. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, one other question here in the chat. Um, does anyone have a checkoff sheet for everything required for a site review or conditional use permit? It'd be really nice to have one. Does anyone have one of those? Jason, Jason, in, in Weathersfield, we uh, we are uh, planning to develop one. Uh, 
so there's a checkoff for the ZA to be able to look at stuff and say, is this, 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 and this all here? And also for the zoning board to have a checkoff of their own to see if uh, all of their best they can ahead of time, their, all their questions have been addressed. I, I think that's great. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of checklists, you know, application forms, I think generally could be a lot more clear about what the requirements are and that sort of thing. So I think checklists are a good way to do that. And um, whether it's a checklist for the board to kind of, you know, use as, you know, are they meeting all the applicable standards or some towns have like a, they call it a decision template and it literally you know, lists all of the applicable standards. I think those sorts of things are really good ideas. Um, if you don't have them, maybe we could look at what Weathersfield comes up with. Um, eons ago, uh, Larry Slayson, who's an attorney, did a little thing for us. And we do have some old decision templates um, we could provide. They're really detailed. Um, you, might, you might want something more simple, but. Um, there are some of those things out there. So certainly um, give me a, an email or something like that if, if anybody wants to see that sort of thing. So we got, got about 10 more minutes or I could stick around a little bit. Um, are there any other questions? Jason, I have a, I have a question. Uh, ex parte communication, uh, if you, we've had, situations where the zoning board has some questions to ask the zoning administrator about uh, what is legitimate. The ZA comes in and says, I think this is a conditional use. And, and I was at that time chair of the zoning board and I looked at the regs, at the bylaws, and I said, I do not think this is a conditional use. But uh, how much of that do we have to divulge or how much of that conversation between the ZA and a, and a zoning board member is ex parte communication? That is an, really an excellent question. Um, I'm not sure if I have the legal answer to be totally honest with you. I think there might be some nuance there because the ZA might be your staff and maybe there's a little bit of allowance for that sort of thing. But I think in terms of um, you know, in terms of practical matters, you know, I think you want to make sure that, you know, there's that appearance that it's all on the up and up and, and so forth. And, um, you know, I don't know if that, I don't know if a chair talking with the ZA is necessarily a ex parte communication problem. I'm happy if other folks have different opinions, if you want to chime in. Um, what I think is probably more important though is at the hearing, um, it's just really clear that the, you know, the board says, okay, we have, we're trying to decide if this is, you know, conditional use or, or where does this project fit? And then, you know, so the board at open, you know, during the hearing makes that decision perhaps, I don't know. Um, does that help? Does that answer your question? Sort of? Uh, it helps, but it doesn't quite answer the question. <laughs> but I don't blame you for that. I I uh, I think it's a little sticky about uh, 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 wanting to follow the letter of the law, but also trying to make the process work smoothly and have knowledge ahead of time about is it appropriate to bring this in as say a site plan or conditional use or whatever. Uh, yeah, so. So I, I, I see that you can't quite answer it succinctly. <laughs> I think maybe Allie's on the phone. You're, you're certainly welcome to chime in, Allie, if you have an answer. But um, it's a tough question, I think. Yeah, it, it's a great question, but a tough one. Um, I'd have to sort of agree with Jason. I, you know, I wouldn't be primarily concerned about that type of communication. I think there is... Obviously, as um, staff, you have some leeway to have those discussions. Best to always disclose, I think, if you're if you're overthinking or if it was a conversation that went beyond um, interpreting the bylaws, perhaps. But 
but yeah, I'm with Jason. I can't, I couldn't give a definitive answer there. And sorry for losing you all before. Of course, the power would go out in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> I know I've had um, theoretical conversations with the chair of the DRB, um, leaving out as many details as possible to say, what would you think about this situation? Do you think it's conditional use or we should do something else? Or, um, But it always was very carefully put as a, the a theor theoretical question, not, not about any particular application. And, you know, you can always have, I mean, again, it depends how each town, you know, is operating and what the ZA's role is defined to be. But, you know, it's not the worst thing, I don't think, to have, you know, a zoning administrator who might, might provide some form of written recommendations to the board and the board during the meeting, there it is, you know, it's a written part of the record and the board might decide to go another way, but that's, you know, but that might be another way to do it is, um, you know, the, the ZA provides some recommendations um, during the hearing, it's part of the record and the board says, you know, upon further consideration, you know, I really think this really is a conditional use or, you know, whatever, whatever the decision is. Our, and I guess the other thing I would say is, um, you know, don't forget um, VLCT. Um, they they offer, you know, if you're a member, and I think you all are, you know, they do offer um, a free opinion on stuff. You can't overuse it. Uh, they don't want you to contact them every other day. But, um, you know, if there's a sticky question, they are attorneys, and they might be able to answer it if we can't. Any other questions? Well, as always, I, I hope this is helpful. Um, yes. at, the, at the very beginning of the chat, and I'll put it up again, I, you know, I really, we, we, um, we want to make sure these things are helpful for the future. And so, you know, if you have a moment, um, you can click on that link after we're, you know, before we're done, I guess. Um, or we can pass around in an email afterwards. You know, we really would appreciate your your input on whether this was good or how to do it better next time. Um, and I see we already have a suggestion for maybe how to write a good decision might be a nice training for the next time around. Um, in the survey, if you have other thoughts on the next training ideas, uh, we'd love to hear it. That'll, that'll give you an opportunity to, to let us know what you think. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hope Thank that was you. helpful. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Where will the, you're going to post the recording on your website or? Yes, we, um, so we're going to um, send the, uh, the presentation materials to you all. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope I find, if for some reason you don't get it from me, Maybe I couldn't find your email. So, uh, you know, maybe get, shoot your, you know, send me an email um, if you don't get it. But um, we will also make that video available somewhere. I don't know if it'll be on the website or somewhere else. And we'll send that link around. So if there's anyone, you know, on one of your boards that you think would be interested or whatever, please definitely feel free to, to pass that along. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.